So, today I would like to do, uh, as this scene suggests, uh, uh, tell you about how uh, the sense of motion is um, analyzed by the visual system. And there are a few areas in the back of the cortex that are involved in analyzing uh, vision. Uh, but the, the probably most important part is located here. It's called the MT+. Plus. And if you look here, you can see a structure called the um, inferior temporal sulcus. And it heads up here. And where, at the point where it heads up is where you can find this area. Now, this was first identified in the owl monkey. And um, in the owl monkey, it's located in the middle temporal gyrus. And that's where the name MT came from. And it's stuck. So the, even though now it's, it's el not the medial temporal sulcus, but the um, inferior temporal sulcus uh, in humans, um, the, we still keep the monkey name for, for it. So that's where the odd M, uh, symbol MT comes from. Now, um, if you don't have MT, this is what the what the image looks like. Okay, instead of a um, a, a continuous pattern, what you see is a, just a bunch of stills. And looking at this bunch of stills, you can, by thinking about it, decide which way these cars are moving. But it's a bit difficult. Moreover, it's hard to tell what speed they're moving at. And so uh, if you want to try crossing this traffic um, without the lights changing, uh, you, you'd have difficulty judging uh, when it might be dangerous and when, when it might not be. Now, when, if you only have empty and nothing else, this is what the image would look like. You wouldn't be able to see clearly, and everything would be in black and white. And that's because this area empty um, doesn't get any of those uh, double opponent cells that, that uh, are important, driving those blobs for color. Moreover, it's the, the receptive fields that it ha does have get are very large, and so you can't see detail. But you can discern that things are moving, you know. Maybe uh, when they get close, you can figure out that they're a car, not a truck, and uh, but you can't figure out what the make of the car is or anything like that. So they can't identify the, the, the object. However, when you have both, um, what MT working, and LOC working, then what you do is get this clear image where you see both what the, what the object is and where it is and how fast it's moving. Um, so that's done by a combination of your what pathways and your where pathways. The, the, the where pathway, again, provides this the, the, your sense of motion, uh, the what pathway tells you what the uh, what it is that that is moving at that speed. Now the signal for for motion. Um, well, there are two signals. One is the parvocellular signal. The parvocellular signal is that coming from the fovea, and um, it goes, um, first of all, to area layer 4C. And the part, uh, so that's giving you a signal from the fovea. And that's giving you things like color. And it's also giving you things like form. And that signal goes from layer 4C to these higher and lower areas that we saw in the previous lectures. So here is, is, is color blobs, 
and around here you have these pinwheels and they tell you what the orientation of the lines are. Now the motion signal, the, the, the input here is from the magnusolar part of your LGN. Okay? And it's the input that has that low acuity. It doesn't have color. Um, and it goes from layer 4C to layer 4B. And here we find, again, orientation uh, sensitive cells, somewhat like simple cells, but all with these large receptive fields. And from here, the, the, from layer 4B, the signal goes directly to MT and also indirectly to MT through areas V2 and V3. Now, what you saw there was uh, a light activating each of these receptors uh, one at a time, and then this cell firing. And the reason this cell firing was because all these inputs were timed to arrive at this output cell at the same time. Okay? And because they all arrived at the same time, they caused this cell to fire, and this cell then signaled, yes, I have motion in this direction at a certain speed. Okay. You'll see in your problem set that if the speed were to be different, this timing would be not the, at the same time. Or as we see in a moment, if the direction is different. See, now in this opposite direction, um, all, all these um, signals arrive at the output cell, not at the same time. And this says, so this, this, then this, is, this cell is particular for a particular direction at a particular speed. Now, in species like birds, you find these types of circuits all within the retinal. So these are your rods and cones, and these are ganglion cells. But in, in other species like us, um, this, this circuitry occurs within your primary visual cortex, area V1. So these aren't rods and cones, but layer 4 C cells. OK. So some of the characteristics of, of how, uh, sensing motion. Now, if you look at this, you'd say, OK, this one here, that's moving down to the right. This one here is horizontally, and this one's moving uh, up to the, to, the, to the right, up and down to the right. Um, but if I get rid of the uh, black, you can see that this line is moving horizontally, this line is moving horizontally, and this line is moving horizontally. So somehow it is because we put this, put the line behind this, this um, uh, covering up the, the end of the line, that we get this illusion. Why is that so? Well, just looking at this line, we really can't tell much about the direction that it's mo really moving. But so the brain does is make a best guess that somehow the, 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 somehow it makes its best guess that this line is moving perpendicular to the line. Okay. And that's that's a good <coughs> guess and and, 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 and and you can see how it might do that. Uh, w one good guess is, is, is that moving perpendicular in the line. And it does that by combining signals from these, these uh, simple cells, as we saw before, to make this complex cell. And these simple cells are each tuned to this particular orientation. And so only lines that are moving in this direction will activate that complex cell. Life, as always, gets more complicated, okay? So while we think we come up with a simple solution to the problem, um, we look at this. I don't know where that sound is coming from. 
Oh, <laughs> okay. I thought it was my line. <laughs> that was a Bruce. That's fine. No problem. Um, anyways, so so so. Yeah, okay, what's happening here? Well, it looks like the line is moving along the vertical and then horizontally. Okay, vertically and then horizontally. Well, again, it it isn't. Okay, in real life, it's moving the same way. But again, it's when it's hidden behind here that somehow the brain judges it to move differently in those two situations. Well, here we don't have the circular aperture I showed you before. We've got something else, and so something else seems to be going on. The brain seems to be some, doing something more. It, uh, it seems to be also being able to attach an estimate of where the ends of the lines are. Okay, So over here, its, it's guess was pretty good using those simple to complex cells connections because the ends of the line were in this particular situation um, at perpendicular. But here you can see that the ends of the line are, the image isn't very big, but you can see those little round circles following the line. It just estimates that the lens, ends of the line are where the line ends on that screen. Okay. And from that, it, it computes what direction the line is moving. Now, so we, we, the, 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 about 10, 15 years ago, they discovered from doing experiments with monkeys that uh, MT is the, uh, the region that actually senses what your, the direction um, of this perceived moment. We saw this line was moving in this particular direction in the, pre in the previous case here. So we have this perceived motion, okay? So what you perceive may not be reality, but what you perceive is what MT senses. So your sense of perception is congruent with what MT is signaling. So how, how do they do these experiments? Well, they place electrodes in V1 and in MT. There, there's V1, the back brain. There's MT. And, uh, and then they um, provided different stimuli to the brain or, or t through the visual system. So they tried lines that are moving in this direction, in this direction, and in this direction. So they're recording from one V1 neuron. And you can see that this particular one likes lines moving um, down and to the right. Okay? So remember that. Next, they put an electrode in MT and searched around for a neuron. And by chance, they would have to find another one. And this one here would also, by, just by chance, have the same direction of motion. So from this particular experiment, you can't distinguish between an MT cell and an V1 cell. They both respond the same way. So next, they tried a different stimulus, and that's called a, a, a plaid or plaid stimulus. You can see here, one set of lines, the green set of lines, are moving one. Blue is in the other direction. And when you combine them, they move differently. So again, down up, and then horizontally. See what the plate comes in? It moves horizontally. Now, there's nothing physically moving horizontally. <clears throat> one is moving down. They're both moving to the right. But one is moving down to the right. The other moves moving up to the right. But when both are shown, you're given the perception where, uh, of moving just to the right. There's nothing physically moving in that direction, but that's what your perception tells you it is. So what if they, what if now we went back to these two cells in V1, both of them like going down to the right, okay? They're both like, like that particular direction. We're showing this, this, this plaid stimulus. And here, let, let's first, uh, oops, try this one. Okay, so when we try this one, your perception here is to the, to the right. Okay, so MT, that one, that, that MT one that we were looking at before, 
liked moving down and to the right. So it doesn't fire. The V1 cell is firing, and that's because one of these lines, sets of lines, is moving in that direction, down to the right. Okay. Remember, I think it was the blue set, the blue of the two. So that, that cell does fire. Okay. Now let's try a different direction. Okay. Now, when we, we your perception here is which way? This way, eh? You perceive this, the perception is that these lines are moving in this green direction. Physically, there's one set of lines moving this way and one set of lines moving this way. So now, in V1, there's no line that moves this way. Okay. But that's the direction that the MT cell fires. And similarly, if we try this direction, again, we get this, this guy lighting up. Well, that's because we have one set of lines is moving in this direction. Your perception is down, not this way. Okay. So the MT cell doesn't fire. Okay. So that experiment tells us that MT fires not what is physically happening on the eye or the retina or in V1, but what your perception is telling you the line is doing. Whereas V1 is responding to what is physically occurring on your retina. The other thing that, that, that uh, MT cells like is that you pay attention to the object that, that, that you're trying to determine direction and velocity from. Okay. So here, there's in this particular case, there's a single dot going back and forth on the eye. And this cell seems to like objects that are moving up. Okay. You can see the cell is firing and then slows down. So it likes upward cell, upward motion. Now what we're going to do is switch our attention. We tell the, the, the subject, look at the, the, the certain color. In this case, it's, it's blue, now it's green, okay? So now it's green and it cell fires, now it doesn't fire. Now the cell fires when the, the blue line is going up. But notice that the green line that was firing before was going up. So the cell, even though there's a green line going up, the subject wasn't paying attention. It was paying attention to the blue um, dot, not line. Um, and it, it, uh, the activity shifted to the blue dot. So it, MT has this ability to rely on attention to um, block the motion of certain objects and not others. So if an attention is focused on the blue, then you, you only fire when, when the blue dot moves in the correct direction or vice versa. Okay, so MT is, is, you can imagine, is an area that represents different parts of uh, V1 or the retina. Similarly to how uh, V1 represented uh, different parts of the retina. And each one is a little column, and that column represents a certain place on the retina. And this is an adjacent column and that represents an adjacent place on the retina. If you take one of these columns and expand them, you get a figure like this, okay? Now, this fi the, the, the direction of the arrow on this figure represents the direction of motion. The color represents whether that motion is for an object nearer than what you're currently focused on or farther than you're focused on. So reddish are, are things farther away, greenish are things, or the reddish is nearer, and the greenish is farther. So, so how do you determine, uh, how, do you, how do you sense, let's say, right? Well, it's which of these is firing. So it's a, 
which one is firing the most. So when, when uh, I can't find the ones over to the right now, but they're, let's say, well, whenever this one's firing, you sense the most, then you sense that the motion is to the left. And whenever this one's firing, motion is, let's say, down. Okay. So it's which of these is firing the most that determines um, the direction and depth in, in three dimensions of the, of the object. Now, from MT, information flows to an area called MST. And MST is divided into MSTL, which is the lateral, and MSTD, which is the dorsal. And each one is uh, sensitive to a very different thing. MSTL is sensitive to objects that move. This little plane flying by, fly, flying by when you uh, when you watch your tennis match, the the ball moving back and forth. Um, so just look, a bee fly or a bird flying, things like that. So it's a uh, objects that are moving. In contrast, MSTD is sensitive to you moving. Okay? So you're sitting in a car and it's the direction that you're moving in, in that car. So uh, whereas before you looked at something small and so that something small is just dependent on what you're looking at and it, it, it requires a high acuity. When you're sitting in a car and looking at what direction, it, it's the motion that your whole eye sees that's important. Okay, so it's a motion over on this part of the eye, the, this peripheral part of the eye on the left, and the peripheral part on the right that's important. And so these, this, this part here has very large receptive fields. It gets its receptive fields. Um, extend to both the right and the left visual fields. Up to now, we've been just looking at areas that light things on the contralateral visual field. P1, remember, saw everything to the opposite side of the visual field. And MT did likewise. This is the first area that we were looking at that lights both sides. Well, well one other area was fusiform face area. That, that had large bilateral visual fields. It doesn't matter where whether the face appears in the left visual field or the right visual field, you still recognize the, the face. Okay, so this gives you a sort of um, optic flow or um, the sensations of moving. So for example, if you're parked behind a truck and suddenly the truck starts moving, you often sense that you're moving backwards, pressing the brake harder. Or you're sitting in a subway car and the, um, the, 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 you're, uh, and the, it, you're parked across, across from you is parked another subway car and it takes off. You often miss and have the sensation that your subway car has suddenly started to move. And again, you'll be look, looking at something here and if you saw everything receding, like, like over here, you'd have a, um, a sensation of you moving backwards. If you, on the other hand, everything was expanding, you'd have a sensation of moving forward. Now, to do this moving forward, you have to have um, uh, these arrows on your left and right visual fields moving in opposite directions, okay? That's how you sense moving forward. And that information, Okay, goes from um, the, the MT on one side and the MT on the other side, and getting together in MSTD, giving you that combined signal, okay? converging onto a single cell in MT. And to the right, to the left, then tilting your head one way, tilting your head the other. Each of these patterns, each of these motions elicits a different combination of motion on your eye. And you, there's different cells in MSTD that 
um, combine these motions in different ways. So you see, it's the same arrow, but you combine them in different ways. You can then sense motion in different directions. So MSTD again is organized into columns, and but each column now um, detects this particular flow pattern. So it'd be one cell, one group of cells that likes this flow pattern, another group of cells that like this one, and so forth. Okay, there's still another thing about sensing motion. Um, both the thing on the left and the thing on the right um, is pretty equivalent pictures, except the one on the right is moving. And because of that simple thing, the one, the one that motion, you tend to perceive things um, as in 3D. You have a better sense that, that those yellow flowers are behind the purple flowers. Okay, and what, what's happening here? Well, things are moving at different speeds on your retina. Things farther away are moving at a slower speed, and the ones close up are moving at a faster speed. And because of that, you can segregate the flowers in different depths. Now, remember, we first covered this in, in, in stereo vision when we talked about V1. And in V1, what we did was we saw how different cells in V1 prefer different disparities. Okay? But that signal is good for only a certain distance about the arm, length, arm, arm lengths. Um, anything further away, the angle becomes so small that that signal becomes useless for judging depth. So it's useful to have this other signal. And that other signal is called motion parallax. And it, it's not a question of what the difference is uh, with, for a single eye compared to the other eye. But now, on the same eye, what the difference is in time, okay? how fast things are moving over time. You can see that the green square here is depicted by this green square on the back of the eye. And that's sweeping the back of the retina faster than the, the, the red circle. Okay? So from that, you judge, the system judges that the green square is closer to you than the red square. So. So the objects themselves are, co are coded in, in, in the ventral watt stream, but motion, the motion system coming from MT um, allows you to give them this depth attribute. Remember, there are some cells in MT that judge direction, and others were judging depth. So the parallax is one way of judging depth for things that are closer. It's the disparity of the judge's depth. A complicating factor is that you can, you can point your eye and pursue whatever object you point your eye at with eye movements. So this circle here is showing where you're looking at, okay, and what direction the motion is in that part that you're looking at. Well, also, one thing is that uh, exactly where you're looking at is relatively still on your eye. And it's everything else that is moving. Okay. Here you're looking at something different. And that object is still. That particular flower is still. But everything else is moving relative to it. So it gives you uh, what, 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 what's moving and what still depends where you're looking. So here we are looking 
at, let's see, this green dot, green, green square. So you can see this green square is stationary on the back of the eye. And the red circle is moving. Here you're looking at the red circle. And that is now stationary in the eye. And that square is now moving. So the brain has to know not only how, th how fast things are moving, but where, how fast your eyes are moving. It has to put those two things together. And how it does that, where the signal for how much the eyes are moving comes from, we'll take in a moment. That signal of how fast the eyes are moving and how it determines um, uh, how that is used to determine uh, self-motion. It's called quality of discharge. So an image moves on the eye for one of two reasons. One is that this object is moving, or because the eye is moving. Okay? You're either turning your eyes, or you're turning your head, or, or your body, or this object is far is really moving. And it's important to distinguish between the two. You know, it's important if this is getting bigger suddenly, is it because I'm, it's coming towards me or I'm coming towards it? Now, this internal, this, this ability to figure out what, what, how much it's moving uses something called Crowley discharge. And this was a, a, something that was proposed by a fellow called Helmholtz, who was a physician and a, uh, a physicist and lived several hundred years ago. And he suggested how you distinguish with the, between uh, these two situations. He proposed that the retinal slip on the eye is combined with an internal sense of motion. And this internal sense is what we call quality discharge. And it's used to improve your sense of motion. So what the brain does is whenever you send a signal to move the eye, a copy of it, the caloric discharge, is sent to a comparator, which compares what's coming from the retina, the retinal slip, and compares those two. And that gives you the perceived motion of the object. So this is what the object motion is. This is what the motion on the eye is. And if this comparator is correct, it is what the object is actually doing, not what you're seeing on the retina. Okay. So if everything works, you're actually figuring out what, what, what the lion is doing. So for example, here we can see that something's moving on the, on, on the retina but we're also moving the eye. And we compare the two, we discover that the, the lion is still, okay, because these two signals cancel out. The same thing happens, um, you know, your eye can also move when you move your head or your trunk. And um, when we walk forward, the eye is carried forward. And so this, this is a general quality discharge uh, uh, caused by anything moving the eye. Okay, this motion after effect. S stare right at the center here. Somebody's not staring. Any sensations for the, I'll try that again. It was getting better here, okay. 
we'll try that again. Look, look carefully. When, when I'm done, when I click this thing off, look at your hand, okay? So your, your, your transfers to your hand too. <laughs> yeah. So what's going on here? It's called the motion after effect. And it's an effect that's produced by uh, changes in MT. And one common misinterpretation, it's because neurons get tired. So when this thing starts spinning, the neurons fire fast, but over time they get tired and uh, they, the, the, their things reduce. And then um, when you stop it, you get a rebound okay, effect. And that causes the, the motion after effect. Um, we can, it could be that, that but, but, but the neurons don't fatigue. Uh, what could happen is that the brain is in, in, isn't as interested in things that are moving at a, that are constant, okay? And so the system adapts because of, um, you know, lack of interest. The other possibility is that something else is going on. And one of the proposals is that you have in your MT a scale, and um, you've got some cells that, that, that when they fire, you sense that, that you, you're moving slowly in this direction, and other cells, when they fire, you sense that things are moving fast in, in the same direction, and over here that you sense things are moving in the opposite direction. When things are moving constantly, in the same direction, this scale gets distorted. Okay. And it is because of that um, distortion that you get this after effect. So you can see here, when we start this up, these cells here start moving closer together. So they become more sensitive to small changes in this particular velocity. As a consequence, if you, uh, if you look carefully, these cells are being pulled far farther apart, so they be become uh, less sensitive to changes in these particular velocities. And in particular, this cell here that sends motion in the opposite direction got pulled over to zero. So now when we stop, okay, um, that, that cell here um, was w it w would be fired, and that one, or when you said here, it would be fired. It, it's this gets pulled over, and we would stop. That cell would be fired, but it was sensitive to a, a slow velocity in the opposite direction, and that's the sensation you'd get, and that causes you this this thing, this hand up here that's moving towards you, because it, the spiral is in the opposite direction. So let's let's follow this this uh, this one here this this one that senses motion it, a slow speed in the opposite direction. So we we pull it over to zero, and then when it stops, this 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 stationary object activates this cell, but it was what sensed motion in the opposite direction, not this motion. So it's a, a, a question of change of the scale. And the purpose would be to be able to detect small changes here. So you're driving, let's say, uh, down to Toronto. You're always driving at the same speed. So you have to get this crowding at this speed so you did, can detect small changes in that speed. What's interesting about this? Well, I think we showed you this before. As long as this, these, dot, these little lines are moving, you can sense the lion. When they stop moving, this thing, the lion gradually fades away. 
Well, that's interesting because here we have MT telling LOC something, okay? So MT was segregating which lines are moving, put them, and told LOC that fact. LOC on its own doesn't detect motion. Motion is sensed in MT, but motion was providing a signal to MT as to which lines were moving together. And from that, you detect that the lion, and that signal of the lion was then sent to the inferior temporal cortex. Now, what's interesting here, you, you sense that this white square is moving back and forth. Okay? But actually, there's, there's nothing moving here. What I've drawn is, 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 is put um, a white square over these uh, circles in one frame and put this white square over these lines in another frame. And I'm simply going from frame to frame. There is no red circle, white, 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 white square. In any case, uh, what I've done here is, is, is uh, uh, I this this white square is is caused by illusion of this these corners becoming white, and it's um, your your the cells in your V2 that are putting these illusionary lines and images of the square together. And the same thing's happening over here. You're blocking out certain portions of the line. And these illusionary um, lines put this square together. So you're using that, those pathways um, to be able to recognize this object. But at the same time, so these two squares are being coded in MT. And MT. Uh, not, uh, those, those two squares have been coded in LOC, and it's the signal to MT that's providing you with a sense of motion. Okay. So from V1, the cells in V2 and so forth start to put together these illusions of those squares, and it's those two, the fact that the square is in one position at one time, another position at another time, that's that signal sent to MT, and that's where your sense of motion again comes from. So MT and LOC cooperate, sharing information. The last thing I'd like to talk to you about is biological motion. So when this thing moves round and round and round, you sense that it might be it's, this is composed of little sticks but gives you the image of uh, a, a statue that's standing but its limbs are and are rigid okay the angle of its ankle isn't changing the angles of its arms are, are changing um, so from again motion you can det determine the three-dimensional shape of an object over here, you can tell that the angles are changing. The, the knees are changing shape, the, the arms are swinging. Okay? That's more complicated than this. Okay? So um, you're, 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 to be able to detect, you must from this detect not only the, sh the shape of the object, that it's a human being, but that the angles of, their, of the, the joints are changing over time. So that 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 um, that relative motion of these body parts requires a new structure. It's called the superior temporal sulcus. This was the inferior temporal sulcus. This is superior temporal sulcus. This is where this biological motion is coded, and this shares information from LOC, which is what determines the that this is an object, but this requires also a signal from MT to tell this area how fast the, the different parts of it are moving. Now, this area at MT from a very few fragments can tell a lot about what it is that it's being shown. 
you could tell from a gate. Uh, I, I'll show you a demonstration in just a moment that you can tell from just the gate um, what the sex of the person is. Um, uh, you can recognize people by their gait. Now, so just to summarize, um, this area that we've been looking at, MT, has several interesting properties. First of all, it gets its information. In, as I, oh, there was a question. Um, okay, uh, maybe I misspoke. It's, it's this whole uh, what pathway that includes IT that tells you what the object is. Um, yeah, but it, but it goes through LOC, but it, 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 it includes the, the whole what pathway. So, we, MT, as we first spoke, it first spoke about it in the introduction, gets its information from the parvocellular uh, part of um, the, the retina and from the uh, parvocellular part of the LGN. And from, so from that, you might think it's part of this wear stream. Well, several people have proposed that it's in fact a third stream and they've called it the when stream and it in turn feeds the where and the what. And it's because of its emphasis on time. So to figure out how fast an object is moving, you need to have this sense of time. 